little to indicate it was a machine of this size compared to the rather larger machines his family made. This is the sort of role it plays and in this case it's the music of Chopin. Dennis, how old is this machine? Oh, the machine is uh, 80 years old. It's just had a birthday and being 80 years old and the role is even older. The role goes back to 1905 so it's nearly 90 years. Old. And the playing here is by Vladimir de Pachmann, and he was a man who was alive when Chopin was alive. And when you consider that Chopin died in 1849, it takes us back a long way. So here is Pachmann playing the music of Chopin. Machine, Kylie. Mm -hmm. This one is another Veltiminon. Uh -huh. uh, it's not as old as this one. This one's 70 years old. And um, we're going to hear Fanny Bloomfield's Eisler. An important point about this machine is that it's independent of a piano. It, if you look down here, you can see it has 80 fingers and it has two uh, feet as well. And oh. they play on the pedals. Uh -huh. Why did they invent a machine like this? Well, I think probably because people like to perhaps keep a favourite piano and have a machine that they could use separately and push up to the piano and oh. play it. Mm. So you, you mean mm. if we separate this machine? It's an entirely separate machine from a piano, and you push it. You can push it up to any piano, in I fact, see. and play on it. Uh, here's Fanny Bloomfield's Eisler, and she's playing more Chopin. This is recorded about 1910. This machine, uh -huh. as you're here. This roll, look at this. 
Oh, such there a gorgeous are. antique. Beautifully well done, yeah. isn't it? Yes. This is played by Paderewski. It's the music of Schubert, and it's arranged by Liszt. I suppose the machine must have taken me oh, two years to build, hobby time. Mm -hmm. you know? Two years? Mm, two years of hobby time. And uh, it certainly sounds well. So here's Paderewski playing the music of Schubert. <laughs> Have you seen all your wonderful collection? Would you like to tell us when and why you started your collection? Well, when is easy. Uh, when I was about 15, mm -hmm. uh, my father's health deteriorated, and we had a play of piano in the house. And um, he said, Well, because of my heart condition, I can't pump the play of piano. So mm -hmm. he decided to buy an electric one, you see. And I wasn't interested, I was a piano student. And uh, anyway, when it came in the house, it was a grand piano with the, it was an Ampico, with the Ampico mechanism on it. And it didn't work properly, and I started to look at the rolls, and I found Rachmaninoff and Schnabel and all these wonderful pianists' names, yes. and uh, that impressed me very much. And, uh, I thought, gee, this instrument must be very different from anything I've seen before at this time. And so uh, I became uh, more and more interested in it from there onwards. Can you tell us some of the most memorable experiences you have? Collecting. Yeah. Oh, I suppose the, the most memorable thing is meeting overseas collectors for the first time when I went abroad, you know, and uh, uh, visiting 
uh, big time collectors in, in England and especially in the United States. And uh, finding uh, <coughs> that machine that you saw that has no keyboard, the first one we looked at, the Velvet finding that machine was one of the most exciting uh, parts of my collecting. I found that uh, <coughs> way out west of Sydney, about uh, uh, 400 miles west of here, in a, it was on a sheep station and uh, had been uh, in the one spot from when it was new in 1913 to when I bought it in 1979. And restoring that and getting it going again was a, a very romantic activity because um, you brought, I was bringing back to life a machine which had been uh, in its day as expensive, say, as a Rolls-Royce motor car. And here I was bringing such a machine uh, back to life again. Besides your own experience, you want to tell us a little bit more specific about the history of reproducing piano? Well, um, I think the fact that Edwin Velty got the idea that you could uh, produce a machine that would play like a person, the very fact that he got the idea of doing it, that's highly original. Nobody had ever thought of trying to make a machine up until then that actually sounded like an individual person playing. And that was, I think, his is a great contribution. Uh, actually doing it with pneumatic devices, which is what these things are, how they work on vacuum, actually doing it once you got the idea, well, that's very clever too, but not as clever as getting the idea in the first place. And I think that's the thing that makes these machines unique. My collection consists of more than 700 pianists, and you really can't mention one of the great concert pianists of the first 25 years of this century who didn't make roles, they all had a go. From uh, uh, the humble playing of a boy named Mike McGee, who was six years old, who made some piano rolls, to the playing of people like Vladimir Horowitz and Rudolf Serkin, and uh, Rachmaninoff and Schnabel and Paderewski, and all the other great pianists of the time. So it was quite a fashion at that time. Yes. Yes. But it was a, a rich man's toy in those days. In the process of your collecting, you must have chances to meet, like, musicians or great pianists. You want to tell us some the of them? The famous person I've entertained in this house was Aaron Copeland, mm -hmm. the American composer. Yes. He came here in 1977 to conduct his third symphony in the Opera House. And a friend brought him here for supper afterwards to hear the one role he made back in 1927. He told us that uh, uh, he hadn't heard the role since 1927 when he'd made it. He sat there watching the Ampico and he said to himself, or he's saying to us, he said, did I play so well? Did I play so fast? It was a very exciting experience to have him here. I recently know that you brought out your um, paper rolls to CDs, to compact disc, mm. and most of the performing artists are pianists. Yeah, well, composers, composers of course, yeah, we've, yeah. we've looked for composers, and uh, uh, actually standing out, outstanding amongst all those pianists is one who was most famous as a violinist, and that's Fritz Kreisler. Uh -huh. We haven't issued any of his CDs yet, but we're going to. Kreisler was also a very fine pianist, so we'll be hearing him as well. Is there any one of them still alive? Uh, no, only, uh, as I say, oh, there's a lot, quite a number of lesser-known pianists who are still alive. Is there any um, important evidence on the paper roll that proved to us is really recorded by? A lot of people ask me, or I'm asked, often asked, how authentic I think the machine is. Mm -hmm. what it does. Yes. Um, well, I think it doesn't exactly reproduce the artist's play, but it reproduces it near enough for a pianist to say, oh yes, that's me. They were, the performances were always submitted to the pianist and uh, uh, obviously he had to or she had to approve of the performance heard and uh, so uh, for me that's good enough that uh, all these well as I say the 700 pianists up there and they, they all said yes that's my playing um, so uh, on a well adjusted and carefully prepared uh, instrument uh, it's amazing how lifelike it all is. Where has your collection taken you around the world? Some wonderful experiences overseas, of course, visiting collectors in, in London and all over the British, all over the world, actually. Um, uh, I find myself uh, 
unique amongst collectors because I have a musical background. I was a music lecturer before I took early retirement to work on these machines. And I have a 